Are you struggling to start a YouTube channel or just gain traction on this platform? Well, today we're gonna to be talking to Rob Wilson who knows all too well the difficulties of starting a YouTube channel and getting those views. He's gonna share with us how he's been able to accrue tens of millions of views in just the last few years. So get ready because we're gonna be talking about getting those views on this platform coming up. This video is brought to you by vidIQ, the number one Chrome extension for YouTubers looking for on-point data analysis, research resources, and enhanced video creator tools. Start getting more views in less time today by signing up for free at vidIQ.com slash influence. That's vidIQ.com slash influence. That's right, influencers. My name is Benji Travis and welcome to Video Influencers where we're helping build your influence income impact with online videos. And that's right, today we're gonna be talking about getting views when you're just getting started on YouTube. Uh, this is not just for beginners, this is really best practices for anybody because you know the principles of success are all the same. And I'm excited about our guest who is also from vidIQ, by the way, the best tool that we've been using way before they sponsored this channel and worked with us. Us. So make sure you go to vid, uh, um, uh, vidIQ.com slash influence to get your free trial. Um, but Rob Wilson is a guest today and he's amazing. You know, he's a YouTube expert and a vidIQ master. He's a creator behind a very successful channel and YouTube tool, vidIQ. Uh, a 30 million plus views, 460,000 subscribers, 500 plus videos, and helping creators just crush it on this platform. Rob. Thank you so much for being here in the studio. Thank you very much for inviting me, Benji. A little surreal story here. Uh, the um, the little vidIQ advert that you just yeah. uh, saw there, Sean was reading out my copy. Oh, I remember crazy. writing out that copy. So that, that's it's awesome that people are writing out my uh, reading out my scripts. Yeah, but thank you for having me. Absolutely, and you know I'm always honored that uh, I get to work and interview different people on the vidIQ team. Obviously, there's many different people, but you're really the man behind the channel, and so I have a lot of respect for you and what you've done for that channel. Usually, when you have a tool or some kind of software, they usually don't have a thriving channel because they're focused on the tool yeah. um, that's what really sets you apart so let's dive into it. like how did you even get your start because of course vidIQ very successful tens of millions of views um, but I know that you didn't necessarily start as a vidIQ guy or uh, that channel correct so I think I first got involved with vidIQ in 2016 but for four or five years before that I um, was running my own channel which was a tech channel and to begin with uh, like a lot of creators on YouTube, uh, f before uh, having ambitions of hundreds of thousands of subscribers, millions of views, I needed to realize whether or not I understand, whether or not I love the video creating process. Mm, and I yeah. think a lot of people, maybe when they start on YouTube, think that they're going to reach these goals and ambitions really quickly without the without really necessarily worrying about just how much hard work there is involved in all of this and i'm sure you're well aware of this yourself like how to be present in front of camera the, uh, covering topics can you turn your passion, your hobby, into something that's gonna inform and educate people on a youtube channel so for a very long time for the first six to twelve months I was a little self-indulgent, I must admit. I was interested in tech and I wouldn't necessarily have a focus. I'd make a video on an Android app one day and then a tablet the next day. And so I was picking up like a, maybe a couple of dozen views here and there, but it took a long time to really realize the YouTube side of yeah. building an audience. To begin with, I just loved being creative. Having a platform such as YouTube, which is free, and yes. you're able to share your values, your message to a global audience, and it doesn't cost you a single penny. Yeah. And I think that is the, still the beauty of YouTube. Yeah. I mean, there's a tiny bit of it that costs money, like with YouTube Premium so much. But <laughs> that, I think uh, the thing you have to realize as a creator, first of all, is that YouTube's free. So you yes. can't give anything, you can't charge or give things away for free. So what's the most important currency on YouTube? And I think it's time. Yeah. You're asking people to spend some of their time with you. Yeah. And 
you want to give them as much value as you can with your content. And that was a mindset which really helped me was trying to think, what does a viewer want to see rather than what do I want to make because yeah. I enjoy making that content? Yeah, I think that it's always a mistake people make is they just assume they know what people want to see, right? And what they're watching, Yeah, uh, you know, based on their own viewing behaviors. But we're all unique as viewers, as humans, obviously. And we have different interests and like consuming things differently. So I think that's what's important important about research, right? And we're going to be talking about that and uh, not just free tools that are available to anybody, but even tools in vidIQ. And so make sure you guys stay tuned. But Rob, what were some of the, um, uh, you know, major game changers for you when you first started, um, whether it was before vidIQ or afterwards in terms of like really uh, started scaling your views up and gaining you the most traction? Yeah. So I had a tech channel. And when you think of tech, you may be thinking Apple or Android, like which side of the fence, Windows, Mac. And I was making general videos on um, Android devices, and it might be an Apple. It was whatever tech I had. And when you think about, I'm not going to say the competition, but the, the fellow uh, creators in your community, the big channels such as Unbox Therapy, MKBHD, they can create any content they want, and the audience is going to watch it because yeah. they have that. The, the X factor, they have the audience, they're going to drive so many views to begin with that YouTube's going to start serving their content to a wider audience anyway. But what, how do I differentiate myself from that, um, from that community in terms of what can I give that nobody else can give? And it took a long time and a yeah. lot of experimentation, but I went from, I think it was iPhone <laughs> to iPhone tips. And eventually I landed on this very specific niche of how to record your iPhone screen. It's, it was something that was a little more difficult four or five years ago because Apple didn't yeah. have that tech natively in their, in their um, software. So you had to download an app. And I made one video on that. And I, then I went on to other topics, you know, randomly looking yeah. at different topics. But this one video, how to um, record your iPhone screen, six months later, oh, it's still getting 50 views a day. You know, for a week, that's 400 views. Over a month, that's a few thousand. And I think... Okay, so I've made that one video, but how I, I can't do another video on this. Like, how can I, uh, some might say, milk this topic? But I thought, you know what? Maybe there's an upgrade in the software. I'll have another go at it. So I made another video. Yeah. Then that video performed better than everything else I was doing. And that was a light bulb moment. It was like, yeah. ah, I think YouTube has maybe decided that I'm the authority. Uh, I'm the go-to creator for this very specific niche. And I'm completely pivoted my channel to that one topic of yeah. how to record your iPhone screen. And when I think back to it, it's like, how can you make 150 videos on that one topic? But it's like, well, I'm going to look at the latest software upgrades. I'm going to look at the audio issues. How does the rotation work? And I was just, I think I have this innate ability to create an idea in my head within a couple of seconds and know the general um, story of that video uh, and then turn it into something. Uh, which was super powerful. And at that point, it was instead of getting 50 views uh, a video, it might be 200, 300, yeah. and then thousands. And I was able to do that for a good year, year and That's a half. That's crazy. Uh, it was incredible. <laughs> and you, you could probably search even now, like how to record your iPhone screen. Uh -huh. And you will probably, I'm not sure if you'll see any now because of like two or three years yeah. ago. Um, but I'm it went back in iOS 10 times, I was just like at the top of the search rankings. And whenever I created another video, I would be at the top of the search rankings. So yeah. it was just, it was wall what, to wall. What was the name of the channel? Uh, VGJ Felix. So if you do how to record your iPhone screen or iOS screen, VGJ Felix, you'll see some videos that have like 100,000 views on, on there. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. You know, so the big takeaway for me um, and even anybody watching it, and I'm sure and comment below if you guys can relate to this, you feel like one, you're not niched enough or two, you niche too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the point of this story isn't that everyone should do something super niche because I do believe and we've actually had other influencers say you don't want to put yourself in a box so small because yeah. it can drive you crazy. However, that's not the point. Look at you like, five years later, right? Not just doing that niche, but you learn so much in that process. Exactly. And yeah. what's important, and this is why I love where this conversation is going, um, it's the experience that is more important than yeah. the strategy. Now that is partly the strategy niching down. And I would definitely say, generally speaking, a iPhone screen recording niche is too small. <laughs> However, in that small window of time, you're dominating, right? And yeah. you're figuring out why you're dominating because you 
you can actually uh, um, uh, transfer that experience and knowledge to what any other niche. And I'd say the second thing is, uh, I guess this is a way I've been defining how to niche yourself. You want to have an overarching niche, right? Like one bigger niche. So in your case, could be like iPhone tips. And, edu but, and education. Exactly, yeah, right? Yeah. But then once you get something that uh, the al algorithm is picking up on and making you authority, in your case, iPhone recordings, just smash that for as long as possible. But I'd say like maybe two out of 10 times, do something completely different that's Absolutely. on that niche. Yeah. Anything else you would want to add to that um, before you share your other big kind of like game changer? Yeah, so um, one thing I, I, I stress to people is um, try and remove a word pigeonhole from mm. your vocabulary because in terms of youtube you're not just you're not being pigeonholed or selling out to a particular topic you're becoming youtube's authority or ambassador or educator on that particular yeah. search term and yeah you're right uh, i did uh, the majority of my videos were on uh, how to record your iphone screen but ultimately that's not going to creatively satisfy me and um how could I further leverage this tech area that was building up in? So I decided to look at the, um, the new releases that were coming out on um, smartphones. So this would like be the big ones, the yeah. iPhone 7, 8, Galaxy S8. And I was seeing that uh, creators were releasing tips and tricks. And it might be 10 tips to start your new phone or uh, the best um, five tips for a Galaxy S8. And I thought, okay, so there's people doing these tutorials. How can I differentiate myself? So this wasn't necessarily a, a topic decision. It was a content delivery decision. Instead of, be, instead of trying to emulate these uh, creators, I'm going to go bigger and better and faster. Yeah. So one of the videos I made was um, the ultimate guide to the Galaxy S8, which was 150 tips. It's like, you don't need to go to seven or eight different videos. You need to come to my video and I will tell you everything you need to know. 45 minute video covered all sorts. It was very um, pattern interrupt type of content where you get a tip in 20 seconds and then you'd be straight onto the next yeah. thing. And the, the viewers lapped it up, good audience duration. And even though I hadn't necessarily established myself in that um, keyword because of the content after a few weeks, again, top of the search rankings. And I successfully did that with, I think it was the S8, the S9, the iPhone 10. So I was able to repeat that. And my strategy was I can't necessarily create the best quality videos yeah. that's not who i am yeah. but i can create the 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 most comprehensive content before anyone else so like when the phone was released i would lock myself in my <laughs> my studio for three days yeah. and make sure i had that video first before anyone else yeah yeah, I think that's important to uh, obviously understand where there's an opportunity and you only get that from doing your research, right? And so we're going to be talking about that, of course. In fact, one of my favorite research tools of late is in vidIQ. And this is, I'm not saying that just because we work with vidIQ or you're from vidIQ. It legit is my favorite tool right now. Like I'm geeking out on it. And it's such an obvious thing to use, except I think like people brush over it um, and it's, it, the keyword research tool. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But, um, you know, obviously you've had this long journey. And you, when you first started, you were just figuring it out. You stumbled on a some niche, but um, obviously you had an amazing success. You know, if anybody uses vidIQ, give us a big thumbs up right now. I know that vidIQ success is because a tool is amazing. However, you should definitely take pride and take some credit for the spreading of awareness of this tool. Tell us what were some of the biggest takeaways, you know, like from when you first started and, and also started vidIQ to where you're at today and what are like the, the big highlights? So the way I first uh, came into contact with vidIQ, not just as a, a, a piece of software, but with the team itself yeah. is I'd started to have success on my channel and I wanted to give something back to the creator community. I wanted to start educating people on how to grow their channels and it, again it was a little bit of a, a diversion from mm -hmm. the tech content i was doing but like you were saying test do different things go a little weird every 20 percent of the time so i started doing little tutorials and i was using vidIQ i was also using another tool at the time but shall not be mentioned but <laughs> they had two very similar um yeah. uh pieces of software, I think it was copy yeah. tags. Yeah. And it just so happened that vidIQs was better at the time. So I thought, okay, I'll do a quick tutorial on how to copy tags. 
are on YouTube. And I did the vidIQ video on my channel. And I just sent out a very simple tweet. And I said, hey, vidIQ, I've made a, a video about uh, how to copy your tags. And within 12 hours, the CEO had contacted yeah. me and said, we love your content. Would you like to do some uh, freelance work? And I said, yeah, absolutely. My first paid yeah. gig. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and it was a funny story because I actually undersold myself. I had no idea how to price myself. And I uh, said, he said, um, uh, this is Rob Sandy, the CEO of um, yeah. VidIQ. He said, uh, how much are you going to charge? And I said, uh, $25 an hour. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 I'll give you $45 an hour. <laughs> so already at that point, he built my trust. Yeah. So for the, next couple, for the next two or three years, I was making tutorial content for VidIQ as, yeah. as well as my own channel. After a, about a year, Rob said, do you want to work for us full time? And yeah. it's like, wow, I've now got a chance to turn my passion into a career. And from that point on... I, I'm, I guess, fully in now with vidIQ and creating their content and have been now for uh, two years full time, yeah. three and a half years um, part time. Yeah. Uh, and it's been an amazing journey. And I think, yeah, it was that point where I realized again, stop thinking about uh, how many views you can get for maybe ad revenue. It's like, what can you give back to your community? And that one video about how to copy tags on my channel got 4,000 views. Oh, dang. Uh, and yet, but it, it turned my life. It yeah, turned, yeah. It, 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 oh, yeah, it like it's not, it's not like a million views or anything, right? But you just never know who's watching. And we, exactly, I, yeah. I say this all, always about speaking, right? Um, a lot of people, they are always thinking like, um, you know, like I want bigger crowds or I want a bigger audience. Well, you just never know. Like it could be 10 people, but one of those 10 people could change your life. Mm. And this is the power of YouTube Absolutely. and just social media in general uh, that you could use a piece of content. That URL that you can copy and paste into an email, into a tweet, into a DM, and then show them your work is amazing. But for you, I'd say, again, to take... Uh, credit and fully um, dive into context, you had already been creating content. Yeah. So Rob, right, the other Rob, he knew what you're capable of. And yeah. this is why the experience is so important. Yeah. That you, even when you're not getting a lot of views, you never know where it could lead you because whether it's getting a job at another channel and becoming like your whole business or even working with brands, I've actually heard of people who really didn't get a lot of traction in terms of their own channel views, but because their content was fire and maybe they didn't know how to do thumbnails and titles, but the right person saw it, they started working with brands. In fact, they become the brand ambassador, sometimes keeping their other channel. And then with that extra money, they're able to hire a team or get contractors. So you just never know Know where life's gonna take you and this is why as cliche as it sounds you just got to get started and start uploading videos and improve with every upload yeah my so although i've done 500 videos on vidIQ there was a thousand videos worth of practice and experience on my channel that got me yeah. the, the vidIQ a thousand kid. yeah i think 1200 and i would love to carry on with my own channel and i i tried to for six months <laughs> but I don't know if anybody else has experienced this. Trying to run a YouTube channel is hard work. Trying to run two YouTube channels, it's a near impossibility. Uh, but I mean, I still give credit to Rob Sandy. Like again, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have gone to all of the conferences I've been to without his support, trust, and loyalty. Yeah. So I was happy to what's called, I guess you would call it mothball my channel. But because of the way YouTube works, yeah. I just did a video on this. I haven't created a video on my channel for two years. Mm -hmm. Um, but because of all of the evergreen content that's on there, I've generated uh, five figures of passive income. Dang. And I haven't done anything on it. And that is incredible, again, all because of YouTube. Yeah, I mean, it's a platform that people are searching for things and they'll continue searching for things, especially if your content's relevant, whether it's funny, uh, pranks or comedy, right? Whether it's some kind of entertainment, whether it's some um, how-to or something. I, I know people have literally got millions of views on a video they never thought was going to be significant. Yeah. They just want to share with their family and friends. So this is what makes YouTube different. Again, we're going to get into some more big uh, 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 takeaways and best practices, but I think the number one thing we definitely want to do with this story of yours is to make people believe not only is it possible, but why YouTube is the best place because it's, it creates 
a platform for yourself for your content to survive for years and years and years and secondly you have methods of monetizing whether it's adsense right uh, google uh, revenue or working with brands or even opportunities outside of the platform and again you know that's that's kind of where uh, twitter fails even Snapchat, Insta Stories, even Instagram, and obviously like Facebook and TikTok, th those pieces of content you work so hard to put up, they're not really evergreen. Mm -hmm. It yeah. almost like yeah. goes into a video graveyard versus YouTube. It's it's like there is there is definitely a graveyard for YouTube, <laughs> but if it's quality content, the algorithm they don't want to reinvent the wheel. This is why some of our videos leak to this day, get hundreds of thousands of views every single month because once you create something of quality that people like, the algorithm's going to keep putting it in front of people. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, um, I, I would just else? say that small rectangle bar at the top of a YouTube page, the search bar, has generated billions and changed millions of creators' lives. And thank God it's there. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, you know, um, the last thing I want to mention is um, obviously your your experience and success doesn't just um, stop at vidIQ. Uh, tell us about what you're going to be doing um, here this summer. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. So my um, my actual um, hard work starts in a week's time. I am going to VidCon London. Um, last year, I went as uh, one of the um, Booth sponsors doing all of the audits. Uh, this year, I am actually talking. I think I am doing, I'm trying to remember the title of it, how to increase views by 900% through thumbnails. I'm just putting the final touches on that. Uh, and then, of, of course, we'll have VidCon in the summer. And last year, I was invited to actually speak there, which was an incredible moment. You, you, th you think of VidCon as almost like the Oscars of the video creating industry totally. and to be invited to speak there. And it's funny uh, when you talk to people and say, how many subscribers do you have? And they might say, oh, I've only got 300 and 400 people. And then you're actually standing in front of a crowd of 300 and 400 people. It's daunting, it's terrifying, but the number of people you can impact, yes. whether it's live, whether it's through video is so powerful. Yeah. And I just feel very privileged to be able to do that. And I never imagined I would do that. 10 years ago when I first started making content, I never imagined I would be at VidCon and people would actually value what I have to say. Well, that's why I want you on here because you are <laughs> super smart. You definitely have a lot of value to give and we're about to get started. Um, hit that like button if you guys are getting value out of this. And again, comment below, what is your channel about? Where are you from? What do you wanna get out of your channel? It's gonna help us have a little bit more context, um, but we're gonna be getting into it right now. The biggest tips, the best practices, the things that actually move the needle. And we're going to be talking about the best tool, vidIQ, to be able to help you do that. So um, how do you actually get views on YouTube? Um, these are the seven tips that we want to share. And number one tip is this. Just get started. Press that record button, get content into your computer, edit something, upload it. And throughout that practice, you're going to gain a lot of experience, which we said is so important before you actually get into strategy. Rob, tell us about this and why this is so important and why you, you find that this is a, probably the number one piece of advice people need, especially when they're first getting started. A good example of this would be check out Mr. Beast. I'm sure you've all heard of him. He's a YouTube megastar of 2019. Go to his channel, click on the video tab, and then sort by oldest videos first. And the first 200, 300 videos were appalling. And he, he admits this, but he look at where he is now and the journey he's been on. I would agree that nothing beats experience. Us as educators can tell you as much as we can and share our experiences. But until you have done it yourself and walk the walk and talk the talk especially, um, it's, it's going to be a struggle. And as, as, as we said before, a lot of people are always thinking about starting YouTube and never actually doing it because of a fear of how your content might be perceived. And a lot of people, once they've created a couple of videos, they want to delete their older videos because they're ashamed of them. And I always say, absolutely not. First of all, you'll lose all of the views on YouTube, but that's, just, that's, that's your journey. That's your story. 
And as I say, YouTube is not a perfect platform and you shouldn't expect to create 10 out of 10 content from the very beginning, unless you're maybe a professional channel or you have a big team and you're wanting to start with a big intent. Um, a good example, again, of this would be uh, Janelle uh, Elena and her van life. Um, she, from two videos, created tens of millions of views and over a million subscribers. And there are some, there's a certain element of naive, naivety to her content. It's, it's a little rough and ready, and sometimes things don't qu go quite right, but that's the, the magic of her content. And I would say from a YouTube platform point of view, you want to know what it's like to upload a video, how to title it, how to create thumbnails, how to create metadata, so that when the video comes along that you want to get out as soon as possible, whether it's for trending content, you know exactly what to do. You know how to create a video in a few hours, upload it to YouTube. If you're waiting for that moment, then once that moment arrives, it may be gone so fast that you never got the video out in time. Boom. And uh, another example I want to give is Sean Cannell. You know, um, I was showing you this little camera right here, you guys, okay? This little camera and setup. The reason I uh, really love this camera, and it's right below a picture of Sean and I, is because that was the camera setup that Sean used to record videos of my wife and I when we had some projects. Um, and I'm just using that as one example of literally hundreds of videos that Sean created, maybe a thousand plus, maybe uploaded 2000 plus for different channels before he ever got uh, started with his other channel, Think Media, which is the number one you know, digital marketing YouTube expert channel on YouTube. And uh, little do people know he started out as um, somebody's videographer, right? Or someone's editor or working at his church, mm. you know, just to put up uh, a live stream before that was even a thing, you know? So uh, just remember that experience is so important and it all starts with pressing record. So the second tip that we want to share with you is niche down and figure out your superpower. It's so important to set yourself apart. And people forget that oftentimes uh, what sets you yourself apart is also your strength. So you have to figure that out very quickly. Rob, tell us a little bit about why this is so important, why niching needs to be taken more seriously, and what you mean by superpower. So in terms of a niche, let's ask a simple question. Benji, what are your general interests just in life? Yeah. Like, like what sports do you enjoy or like what, what films do you do? Well, I love the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, I love pour over coffee and I love going grocery shopping at Farmer's Market. Okay, so let's say you, your first four videos on your channel were about all of those different topics and you release a video every single week. Now, the first one was about CL Seahawks, and you know, maybe uh, 10 people enjoyed that and subscribed, and then they have to wait an entire month and get through the going to the farmer's market and so on before they get back to CL Seahawks uh, content. And I think that's the best way to explain it. Yeah. People usually subscribe because you've, you've caught them on, on some sort of personal connection, whether it's an emotional, educational, and they want more of that. Yeah. Um, and we... we we talk a lot about niching down. Uh, so I think that's fairly self-explanatory. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it takes 50 videos to 100 videos to understand where your niche is. So there's, again, there's nothing wrong with experimentation, but at some point you will have enough data from your content. And that could simply be through views. Yeah. Like, okay, this selection of content on video games gets twice as many views as this content on um, American football. So for the next... 20 to 30 videos, I'll just do video games and see how that goes. And so by all means, nothing wrong with experimentation, but at some point in your journey, you're going to have to decide this particular channel is for this type yes. of content. Now in terms of superpower, the next question is this, why should I watch your content? What makes you different to all of the thousands of other video creators on YouTube? And this yeah. is especially prevalent in, um, channel topics such as Fortnite, where there yeah. are millions of video creators and everybody wants to get into that gaming market. What makes you different? For some channels, it might be, well, I'm going to concentrate on, how, on telling people how to improve their gaming performance. So yeah. it's not necessarily playing the game itself. It's how to play the game with the smoothest frame rate to get the best possible experience for you. So that's where your uh, superpower might be. Yeah. Or it might be the way you present your content. I think we were talking about vidIQ a little earlier in terms of why has it grown so much? 
And when I first joined vidIQ, what I was determined not to do was just to create a channel that was about our tools and telling you, use the competitor's tool. Smart. Or the channel audit tool is really good. Make sure to download it. I was always first about educating the creator and how vidIQ can benefit you. But it's, all, it's usually um, 80, 90% education, 10% vid iq and probably one percent upsell <laughs> yeah uh, and i think people have gravitated to uh, my style and i try and inject a lot of humor into the things that we do and then when we realize that uh people enjoy channel audits we'll do live stream channel audits we don't charge a single thing we actually tell people please don't send us super chats because we don't want to create a barrier to entry we don't want to create make this a financial yeah. game for us we don't necessarily have, I mean, we can't scale up channel audits in any way. Well, I mean, we have a, uh, some software, but we can't give you personalized advance, uh, advice. So the channel audit thing is something that we don't necessarily sell as a product or a service, but it, it tells you that this is what we are about as vidIQ. We yeah. want to educate you on your YouTube journey, whether it's face-to-face -face on the YouTube channel or through the tools that you use. And I think that's where my superpower has come from. But... Yeah, essentially, what makes you different to anybody yeah. else? Yep. And like, how how might you answer that, Benji, when you've been you do your cooking channel and uh, and video influencers? Well, number one, for me, I don't have any hidden motives, right? Mm. Like, it's all out there. I, I don't just do this for income. I really want to help you. My, for example, my wife, when she first started, she had no clue how to handle the business aspect of it or dealing with brands or negotiating contracts or even uh, let alone reading contracts. So I knew that her as well as other influencers had these challenges and I just wanted to continue helping more people. The only way to do that is to scale your time or what your actions and I felt like YouTube was away. And so, of course, I was already friends with Sean. He also had a similar passion. So that's what helped me. That was that was my superpower, or like what, what made me different. I come from a background of already helping creators, yeah. influencers, businesses using this platform. And that's what is different. And also, another thing that sets me apart is I actually vlog, right? I create content all the time outside of video influencers. And so I'm able to utilize those experiences to share. And then I think the third thing for us again like why you should watch uh we're not just telling you what works for us we're telling you what works for people like yourself yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean literally hundreds of influencers of course some of the big ones gary vaynerchuk casey neistat um even ones that you don't know about but are crushing it in their niche so i totally agree when it comes to you know like asking yourself what's your superpower what makes you different what can you bring to the table that's going to make you stand out even in a competitive niche right i think these kind of go hand in hand. It, I always talk about, or actually this is something Sean and I have uh, said in the past, uh, combining niches. So say you're into um, football, right? But you also love uh, cooking. Maybe make a game day yeah, recipes yeah. food channel, right? Yeah. Like you're combining it too. So you're going to set yourself apart because when you're thinking about creating your videos, you're creating videos for people that are into football. So you already know, number one, I mean, this is huge stereotype, but the average football viewer uh, probably isn't like a huge chef. They want something quick, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, they probably also want bite, like bites, little bites or appetizers, little snacks. So you're getting into their mind because you are that person, because it, you're combining your two passions. Anything else you want to add uh, to this um, uh, in terms of what I just mentioned? Yeah, I, I think um, the Sharer Brothers call this trend warping. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another classic example is we see when we see um, Lego channels that are really super popular. We're always thinking, how can you, and whether it's a build or a stop motion uh, type of channel, how can you tie that into popular culture? And it's usually through uh, building all of the Marvel superheroes just before a video is released or like Star Wars came up. How could you tie in your content to Star Wars? Yeah. Um, Travis, who's uh, somebody who does a lot of audits with us, uh, he did a video last Sunday. Or it might have been Friday or Saturday. It was like how to watch the Super Bowl. And he's a tech channel. Yeah. So he was, he was combining his tech um, interests with something that was trending. And it was super popular for him. So, yeah, I think always trying to take your experience and your passion 
again, something that's trending popular worldwide can be something that is really powerful. Absolutely. So um, we're getting some great value. If you guys are getting value out there, click that like button. Go into the description below if you haven't subscribed to vidIQ. You definitely should be uh, uh, subscribing if you feel like this is um, some fire content that you guys are getting on this broadcast. Um, so let's get into the next tip, which is this. Be the number one authority. Now we allude to this a little bit already, but you want to be known for whatever it is that you're doing. So Rob, tell us a little bit more about this. I know that it's similar to some of the things that we mentioned. Um, how do you become the number one authority and why is this important? I'm going to go over a slightly different story this time. I've already talked about how to record your iPhone screen, which is a really niche area. Uh, so I'm going to go a bit broader now and talk about the new creator studio. Uh, so I'm sure everybody <laughs> has at least been exposed at uh -huh. this point. And within a couple of weeks, everybody's going to be forced to use it. What are your general thoughts right now on it, Benji? You do enjoy it or oh, still a work to do? Personally, done? I'm 50-50. Right. I enjoy it. I enjoy some of the um, extra things that weren't available in Classic, but I can't tell you how many times in a day I go back to Classic still. Yeah. It's crazy that's still even available because I thought they got rid of it, but I do go back to Classic once in a while. So again, I'm like 50-50. Yeah. It's funny what most social media platforms will do is just change things without telling anybody and everybody will complain for a day and then three months down the line, they won't remember how it used to look whereas with i think with the new creator studio they've introduced it two years ago uh, and i think i fully converted now along with the vidIQ tools as well but what i realized when the new studio came out was that there's an interesting opportunity here to rewrite the evergreen rule book for uh, educational content on the studio so we have all of these videos out on youtube that have been about very simple things, how to delete a video, how to add captions, how to use a video editor, all for the classic studio. So I decided in 2019, what I was gonna do is create content all about the new tools. So it might be, well, it was all about things that had already been covered in the classic studio, but about the new studio before anyone else. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I made a very simple video this time last year, how to delete a YouTube video. It took two hours to make, I think today it's got 350,000 views. Crazy. Because it's the first video on a new studio. It's at the top of the search rankings. Once the classic studio goes away, I'm hoping that my video is going to be the first one that everybody goes to. And we repeated that with how to create a playlist, how to change your channel name, how to add subtitles. All of these videos now have more than 100,000 views. And this was a, a, a niche of a broader YouTube education beginner's guide strategy. And I'm going to continue to do that. I'm, all, yeah. I'm, I'm, all, I'm, st I'm still brainstorming on what I can do before anyone else. Uh, uh, and, yeah, and, and another thing I've done is I've, I've already made a screenshot of all of the old Classic Studio um, pages. And as soon as the Classic Studio is unavailable to everyone, I'm going to do a montage, a musical montage of how it used to look. <laughs> So I'm hoping that's going to be a pretty successful one, but I'm just waiting for YouTube to close it down. Yeah, I, I you know, um, I love that because, again, you're going to become the authority it, for yeah. the YouTube studio, uh, you know, tutorials. And it's almost like, again, another sub niche of your overarching niche of just helping people on this platform. But when people think, and it's going to happen, right? Once they fully commit to YouTube Studio, they're gonna need to know how to do it. And if they already know that's you, you're already right there at the beginning of their journey, yeah. right? Or maybe in, in the case of a lot of creators who have been on it for a decade, uh, right in the midst of the middle, right? And they might be introduced to you because of power of search. And so being the authority, even in a sub niche is really important. Anything else you'd wanna yeah. add? And here's a really interesting thing about those particular videos. Usually general advice for creators is, more watch time. So maybe make longer videos, higher audience retention, et cetera, et cetera. But always consider your audience first. For example, how to delete a YouTube video. I cannot make a 20 minute tutorial on how to do that because first of all, no one will click on it because it's 20 minutes long. And then if you're going through a lot of preamble, people are going to get bored and frustrated and move on to where they can get the information. Usually with educational content, they want an answer to the question as quickly as possible. So with all of these tutorials, I've specifically made them very short, two to three minutes. So I'm kind of going against 
our <laughs> own general advice. And I'm also front loading the information as well. So they get the answer within right the away. first 50 seconds. And then what I might do to add a bit of time to the video is, okay, so when have you deleted a video or why have you? Let us know in the comments below and like here are the things that you, why you might want to or why you should delete a video. So it ends up being three minutes, but the audience duration is about 50 seconds, mm. 20, 30%. So that goes against general convention and logic of YouTube but it serves up to the audience. That's the most important thing, not YouTube's metrics. It's what the audience wants for that particular uh, topic. Absolutely. I, I definitely think that it's way more important to think about what the audience wants yeah. than what the algorithm even wants, right? I think the algorithm will adjust to what the audience wants because ultimately that's what makes a platform even better. I always say for as much as people hate on YouTube and complain and even feel like there's things that they could be doing that it's in their best interest yeah, to absolutely. make sure you're happy as a viewer, right? So if you're doing the things that's good for a viewer before the algorithm picks up on it or tells you as YouTube, you know, like when they put out their videos, you're already going to be ahead of the pack. And that's what's really important. So absolutely. And so you guys, if you're getting any value out of this, hit that like button, comment below what your channel is all about and make sure you leave your questions. We are stacking them up. And um, if you guys are watching this on the replay, just join our members area to actually get the full length of the broadcast because we do chop off the uh, Q&A at the end. Um, but we want to get into the next point on how to actually get views on YouTube when you're just starting out. And the, the next one is infinite angles. There are so many different ways to tackle a piece of content. And a lot of people, they, they get pigeonholed or they, they feel like you have to do it just like everybody else. Almost every successful creator got successful because they did it differently. We talked about how they're doing it better than other people. Doing it differently is easier, number one, right? Yeah. Um, it's just harder for people to wrap their brain around it. So can you dive into this point of, um, you know, infinite angles or there's always a different way? Yeah. Look at it from uh, this angle of when you make your first video on a topic and let's say it is a successful video and it brings in a lot of subscribers. Your subscribers represent that portion of a potential audience for a topic. Now, you can say that you've already delivered what you think is the most valuable information on that topic and then move on to something else. But what you're potentially missing out on is this enormous audience that still hasn't seen your content on that topic. And if you can find a slightly different angle or another way to approach things, or let's say you made a video and there was a lot of questions from that video, like you could do a frequently asked questions on this particular topic. Like I said, for my um, how to record an iPhone screen, I was able to make about 150 videos on that, different, on that topic because people just still wanted the information or asking me so many questions. And I, I think there is always a new and unique way to look at something no matter how many times you've looked, looked at a particular yeah. topic. And usually the information on that topic is ever changing, especially if it's tech related, gaming related, yeah. uh, that, that type of context. Uh, I think there are always ways to look at it. I, I remember there was one person who pivoted their channel to it being all about Brexit content. Mm. Crazy. How long has Brexit been going on I know, for now? Huh? Like three years. Well, I think we we voted together. If you guys don't know what Brexit is, is basically the UK leaving the European Union. It's kind of like if Texas wanted to leave <laughs> yeah. America in, in a way. Yeah. Essentially, we lost our mind for 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 <laughs> one day, and now we've had four years of fallout. Um, but this person was just looking at every single angle of it because there's new stories on it every single for day. Sure. I I I should all I would always encourage people to say. Um, if you have an idea for a video and you think your audience is going to enjoy it, go after it. And not everybody will agree with this, this um, strategy, but it works for me because uh, I think I'm a video creator that likes to do things rather than make the perfect thing. I think I wrote in my notes here somewhere, um, there's an argument of quality versus quantity. And the argument for me is, is it better to create a seven out of 10 video. So it's, it's good, it's informative. Uh, it might not be the best video out there, but if I can get that video out there before anyone else, who's going to find it first? And that's going to give me like my marginal edge. I think my, um, my advantage is being able to get stuff out before anyone else. Mm -hmm. And we, we did that with tools such as the YouTube hashtags. Th they were released, I think in 2018. And 
I think we can all agree that YouTube hashtags have been a bit of a, a dud. They haven't really <laughs> changed the landscape. By the of way, one of the questions, and let's pull this up, yeah. um, and it's about hashtags. Uh, so I don't want to uh, stop your flow, but the uh, question is this. Um, VidIQ push uh, the importance of hashtags. Do they really make a difference in search rankings? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad that you mentioned that. And like, yeah, I guess, I don't know. It, it might, it might not. I, I think that it's worth using, but yeah, I don't yeah. know if it's game changer. When hashtags first came out, nobody really knew what the, how they were going to impact the platform. Uh, but we made a video out on, on this topic within 24 hours of the news. It's top of the search rankings. It's got a quarter of a million views. Brilliant, fantastic. We realized about a month later that the value of hashtags wasn't that valuable. Or we'd seen a lot of feedback, so we, we created a, 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 um, a follow-up video. Yeah, smart. And, and that was like second in the rankings and has you know, tens of thousands of views. So people are watching that after they watch the first one. Presumably probably, so, right? yeah, yeah. Because the algorithm, you know, this happens with Joe Rogan's podcast, for me at least. Um, if I'm watching one of the clips from his show, right, he similarly interviews people. Uh, if I just watch the whole thing, it could be anywhere from three, to five to 20 minutes it'll almost always show me the next clip from that show or actually suggest watching the whole show yeah. and so this is the beauty of following up successful content with a similar piece of content yeah so we did that uh, uh but in terms of hashtags in general absolutely i think you should use them i don't think you should use them as a a search term for example how to do something i think hashtags are still more valuable as a a community or a movement. I think uh, um, a, a Connor, um, a Cody Wanna, uh, uh, no small creator, yeah. using the hashtags in that format are good. The, the hilarious thing actually is, Benji, that when we did our tutorial, uh, we had some suggested hashtags. And if you search for those hashtags, there are hundreds, thousands of video creators who've used our hashtags presumably not understanding how to use them. Yeah. So there'll be random videos that say uh, vidIQ, uh, or more views, hashtag more subscribers. <laughs> so it is funny. And I guess it kind of increases our exposure in a way. Uh, but hashtags, along with many things, such as um, captions, tags, how valuable are they? My advice always to small creators is any marginal edge that you can potentially have versus a competitor of a similar size, I think you should investigate. Don't yeah. spend hours on it, like thumbnails and titles. I think we all we all appreciate that those are the most important things. But if it takes you an extra five, ten minutes to fill up the tags, yeah, is that information useful? It's better than absolutely nothing, I think. Why does YouTube include them if yeah. if if they're not valuable anymore? Why does some YouTube channels still include tags on their videos, even if they say they're not valuable? Yeah, I, I love uh, diving into this because I don't think too much of it. I think that's a point also that you and I uh, totally understand is you just got to do as much as you possibly can pursuing 10 out of 10. Yeah. But knowing that the speed value in terms of getting it up before everybody else might uh, be much better than waiting another week because you want to be the first on scene. In fact, and we've actually mentioned this about some successful creators, you never know when something's just going to hit right. Um, so you've got to wait out all these variables i do believe in this day quality is so important but sometimes what you think is 10 out of 10 um, might actually be like 12 out of 10 so you're 7 out of 10 as long as you're always improving and uh, pursuing perfection might actually be what's 10 out of 10 yeah, what yeah, is yeah. actually yeah. needed and you just want to get it up um on there as soon as possible so you, uh, we're going to be getting into vid iq and how to actually use it here soon but these are some of the principles that we want to share with you on what you want to focus on when you're first getting started on youtube to be able to get views and so um the last thing i want to mention on this which is be the number one or the infinite angles that there's literally so many different ways even here in this niche as a youtube expert channel the way sean and i uh set ourselves apart because there was a ton of talking head videos uh, uh type of channels um obviously we've got daryl eaves right tim schmoyer roberto, roberto blake was already doing this and a number of other people we are just like we're going to be the interview channel mm, we're going to yeah. this is hence video Video influencers. Really, the focus wasn't us, it was other people. So it wasn't what we knew, it was what other 
their guests knew, whether they're the, like a celebrity type um, that everybody knows or a super niche gardening channel that only in that industry people would know of, we would interview them. So that was what made it really easy. That's what's interesting for our channel because this is a part-time effort for us because we had something that we had a passion for interviewing people um, and we combined it with teaching YouTube uh, principles and best practices. That's what set us apart. So people that like that type of content um, really valued it. And I think, again, it even set us apart from everybody else because we're getting a different dynamic, a different uh, perspective. And we were able to, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, obviously you have success and so many other experts, but a lot of those best practices and tips come from your industry and niche. Um, when you get to interview other people, you go outside of the box, like way outside of the box. So I love this tip about uh, finding different angles to make yourself stand apart and get attention. Uh, and forgive the pun, but I think you influenced us to try that ourselves. We started to do interviews at conferences, but... I've got to be honest, we just can't compete with, with video influencers. <laughs> you do it so much better. But we, we took a lead from one of our, I'm going to put this in inverted commas, competitors or, collabor or yeah. uh, fellow creators. Um, because you should always be watching what your uh, other creators in your space are doing and seeing, can I do something similar? We tried it. We didn't think it was successful for us. And we went down a different path. But at least we tested it to yeah. see if it would work. So, yeah, I think... F f being inspired uh, to try things is always sure. some, something good to Oh, try. yeah. And, you know, Sean's the first to say to um, uh, copy other people. Like, literally copy it and try to make it better. Yep. But ultimately, what is going to make you really stand out and uh, make you build up into a superstar is what is going to be... Um, what is going to be utilizing your superpower and whatever makes you unique. So uh, we're going to move on here. I know that we cut out for a quick second, um, but this is video influencers and we're helping build your influence income impact with online videos. We've got Rob Wilson from VidIQ, one of the best tools, if not the best tool for creators starting uh, their channels and even just getting going. I'm sure that um, I've actually met other influencers who got huge audiences that use VidIQ every single day, but they just maybe wouldn't mention it. It to their viewers, right? Um, so we do believe in it and we're going to get into some best practices. But the uh, next tip is thumbnail game from day one. So what that means is really take seriously those images that you're putting out to the world, advertising your content. Uh, let's dive into this. We don't have to get into too many best practices, um, but what have you found or uh, the best tips and things you found that people make mistakes when it comes to thumbnails? The most common mistake for creators to begin with when they first start their channels is not creating a custom thumbnail. It's pretty obvious and easy to say, um, but it will usually be a freeze frame from the video. And that means it's either a little muddy or a little chaotic, or it just doesn't tell a good story for the potential viewer. Another mistake we often see is over-reliance on text. A lot of people try and tell the viewer everything that's in their video oh, via yeah. text and titles. And uh, that leads on to stuff usually being overcomplicated. There's too many elements to a thumbnail. And if you're looking at a thumbnail for longer than three seconds, you've already lost the potential viewer's yeah. attention. In the blink of an eye, you should get a preview of what's in the video. Yeah. Where you can maybe take three seconds is the title itself. Like, because it might yeah. take you three seconds to read it. Yeah. Usually a thumbnail should have no more than three elements, and that might be a hero, object, or person, or and a, a backdrop of some color which maybe separates the foreground and the background. Text, yes, um, certainly use it, and I think uh, you and Sean are some of the best proponents of, of using text because it's big, it's blocky, yeah. it contrasts to the rest of the thumbnail, it stands out. And I think in educational content, sometimes something that tells you exactly what it does on the tin can also be a benefit as well. If it's more storytelling, then maybe you need sort of like a dramatic moment. Or with some educational channels, what they do is they provide the payoff. Like this is what you're going to get at the end of a video. So if you click on it, we'll start at the very beginning. Uh, so those, I think, are general thumbnail advice ones. I think the best way to describe this is, let's say you had a listicle, and it might be the top 10 video game characters. Yeah. What creators will do is try and every single character in the thumbnail, whereas it's best to have one. Yeah. And then that creates intrigue. It's all, 
Mario's in there. I wonder who else is in there. I don't know because you've not shown me on the phone. Or, or take uh, one or two, put them on there, and maybe like one or two more, blur them out and put a question mark. Yeah, over. I was again, like question mark, you have to yeah. take the, the, the psychology strategy when it comes to thumbnails because people are literally just thinking, I'm going to put what's in there. But part of it is intrigue or interest or mystery. Right. Mm. Oftentimes, in fact, um, if you go to our um, vlog channel, you'll see it. Um, and you know what? The, the biggest tip here for thumbnails, just do a search on the topic yep. that you want to rank for and see what are the best thumbnails that are working. Because what's ranking on YouTube is telling you what people are clicking on and actually watching. So no matter what we tell everyone on here about what's best, every niche, every genre, every type of industry will be slightly different because it's different people, right? A different generation will probably uh, want a different kind of visual because they connect with different things. So there isn't like a one size fits all strategy. The point is, is you just have to always think about these different variables when creating a thumbnail. I think um, Brian G. Johnson is a good example of mm. this in our uh, YouTube education space where he's really experimenting with thumbnails. And you'll see like we have a, a blue branding. Uh, your branding tends to be sort of a black along with another color. And then you'll see Brian G. Johnson. And it's like rainbow vom vomit green or purple, but it yeah. just stands out when you're scrolling through uh, the feed. And the other thing for creators is, once you've created your thumbnail, shrink it down to, so like, I'm trying to get this in camera. This is, this is the size that you create your thumbnail. Yeah. But you need to remember that every single person on the planet is going to see your thumbnail at that size. Yeah. And that's what you need to check. Make sure that at 5 10% of a thumbnail size, it still tells a good story and has that clickability to it. Absolutely. So I just wanted to give a big shout out to Movie Flix Plus for the uh, 20 uh, euro uh, donation oh, awesome. or super chat. Appreciate you supporting our content. And maybe if we at the end we could uh, dive into your channel. Um, but of course, um, we appreciate you supporting what we do here. Um, so the next tip that I want to get into, and the final one, is an audience first strategy. I totally forgot what that was. So tell us what is it? What is it about an audience first strategy that you want to share um, and uh, um, have the audience understand? It's, it's mindset, Benji. When I when we talk to people on our videos, we might say, comment below, uh, what's your target? And a lot of people instinctively say, 1,000 subscribers, 4,000 hours of watch time. Why is that? Because they want to monetize their content. And I feel as if that is a, a, a misconception of the goal of a YouTube channel. The goal of a YouTube channel first is that you need to have a reason to be on the platform and be seen by an audience. You are entitled to absolutely nothing when you start a YouTube channel, even if you think you do, even if you're looking at other channels thinking, I can do better than that. Uh, I can get more views than them because I can create better content. Well, that's fine. Prove it to your audience first because they're the ones who are going to get value from your content, subscribe to you, and then help drive the momentum of your channel uh, eventually. That may mean monetization, but monetization on YouTube is a, a fickle, dangerous thing. We've seen that uh, Adpocalypse, FTC, that can remove your, um, your uh, earnings from YouTube itself. But if you're making an impact with your audience, and as you say, like if one person, a brand is seen and they see real value in your content and it really resonates with their target audience, you could you could have a brand deal that brings you 10x the Absolutely. amount of money in the, uh, that the YouTube revenue would bring in. And I always, uh, I always say this at the end of my live streams. I don't say it at the end of videos because it, it's, uh, I haven't been able to put this into a value proposition yet, which is really succinct. But I say that time is the most important currency on YouTube. And when people are spending time with you, you need to provide them with value. And so consider that the next video that you make. I'm hoping that people are watching this live stream. Uh, we haven't really talked yet about vidIQ at all. We're not here to like really do a, a hard sell. First of all, we want to give you as much value as a video creator first yeah. and how it can grow your channel. Uh, I think at the core of what most successful creators are doing is thinking of their audience first before yeah. anything else. Absolutely, man. Uh, by the way, thank you so much for being on here. <laughs> so much. Value. I'm always learning things from uh, guests that are here in studio or just chiming in digitally. 
but uh, I love hearing your story and how you guys have had so much success. And I do believe this, that uh, vidIQ is the best tool, but notice we haven't even dove into it because the principles are way more important than the tools, right? Yeah, the, I uh, so. the, yeah. the mindset is going to be so key compared to the next hack or shortcut, right? Or the what is the algorithm doing? So that's why we're starting this way. But we are going to go ahead and dive into uh, how to use vidIQ because I do believe that there's some tools that people are completely overlooking. So the first thing I want to say is question of the day. Um, are you just getting started on YouTube or maybe like not getting enough traction? Tell us what your content is all about in the comments below. We always love knowing what you guys are doing. Hit that like button if you're getting value out of this. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and dive into probably my favorite tool. And uh, I don't know like if this is going to mix up anything. I know that we were preparing some stuff. But I, I'd say the number one unused tool that gives you the max ROI on vidIQ is the keyword research tool. Okay. And um, I will say I literally just stumbled on it recently because uh, Sean, by the way, Sean and I work together. So sometimes, uh, you know, I'll share things about my business and my strategies and same thing him. And he would just, I was like, hey, how'd you get that research or whatever? He's like, oh, it's right here in vidIQ. Tell us about why this is so powerful because to give a little context, you can research what keywords and phrases are relevant to your topic, your genre, or even just the type of uh, um, content you want to create. But there's something about this keyword research tool that really sets it apart. Um, let me know if you're ready and if you want to dive into it. And tell us a little bit about how people can use it and why it's so game changer, especially for beginners. So when people talk about keyword research for vidIQ, there are, I think there are two aspects for it. So are we talking about the YouTube side of it or the web app? Um, you know what? I'm trying to think where it is. I, I, so I go to the little vidIQ uh, thing at the top. I, ah, go yeah, to, yeah, yeah. Uh, I go to SEO and tags. Right, right? I'm with you, yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah that section. <laughs> okay, yeah. So because uh, when you do a search on YouTube and you just uh, um, do a search results, there's all sorts of keyword research yes. content there. There's a little... Um, the, the like the myelometer thing, which tells you whether a keyword oh, yeah. is hot or not on all of the tags there. But yeah, we also have the um, dedicated keyword research tool. So I'm just going to very quickly you, uh, type in. You guys, go ahead and switch that. There you go. So how to get more views might be a very simple one that we can do here. Uh, and what it's going to basically do is give you. Uh, it's almost it's like an idea generator. I consider it. Uh, so we we've, we've done a very simple one here. How to get more views. Yeah. And as you can see down the related keywords, we're we're giving you a ton of different ways to look at that keyword. How to get more views on YouTube, how to get more views, get more views 2019, and so on. So you can look at all of these different keywords and say, can I use these to create brand new videos? Or are these going to be the different keywords that I use for a particular video? Because I always like to uh, tell viewers, um, when you're doing a, a, a video about something educational, try and be as specific as possible. So let's say we're talking about a specific YouTube tip. It might be how to delete a YouTube video again. I know I keep going back to that, but it's, it's the, the video I've decided to latch onto. Instead of thinking about this video being a tips video or a YouTube tips video or a YouTube video, it's, it's specifically how to delete a YouTube video. Yeah. And I think that's what people, they miss out on... Uh, Jeremy used to say this, he said, when you're talking about a, a video, you go three inches wide and a mile deep. Mm -hmm. And that's how you should consider your metadata, your titling, your structure. So anything that's like a single word keyword is too broad. Yeah. Uh, like for Seattle Seahawks, yeah. if you just say football, NFL, uh, AFC, those are all too broad. It might be... I don't know anything about American football. But I'm <laughs> That's say, impressive I'm for a Canadian. Say, <laughs> defen defensive linebacker. Yeah, yeah. Defensive linebacker stamina um, strategies. Yeah. I, I don't know. That, that might be a, a keyword that a person okay. searching for to improve yes. their performance in that posi particular position might be searching for. And yeah, we have CFL in Canada, yes. which is really strange. Where you have, <laughs> you have three downs and the end zone is enormous. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going off topic. Um, keyword research tool is there. Uh, it sorts by search volume, search score. I can click on each of these different columns and it will uh, give me the, the information that I want. Uh, a good one here is if I search by number of words, yeah. I can get 
look at this one. A keyword with 11 words is a keyword search term. How to get more views on YouTube with a small channel. Yeah. That's exactly what you want to be targeting with yes. your audience, as, as we've been doing here. Uh, talking about channels starting their YouTube journeys, we assume we're looking at smaller channels. For sure. I would love to add something here, again, why I like this. So this isn't something that it, you have to have vidIQ. I mean, there's other tools out there, but what I like is the fact that it's just so connected to everything you're gonna be doing in yeah. vidIQ anyways. If we actually go back to the the window, um, let's show the audience the window, uh, his computer. So I love that it shows you the search volume to show you the relevancy, right? Yeah. Of it. Like, um, I'm not exactly sure why the search volume is there for how to get a small chat. I know that that is very widely searched. Um, so that's nice. But secondly, it also gives you all kinds of other ideas for exactly. titles. Yeah, exactly. And um, if you go a little bit more, I'd say, um, like simplistic in the search, um, you'll also get ideas for the tags. Now, of course, the whole argument is are tags worth using? Yes, when you're first starting out on YouTube, this is verified by people at YouTube. My wife actually went to a huge conference um, and got the answer ne uh, from a YouTube employee sitting right next to Susan Wojcicki. I mean, it doesn't get more like authority okay. than that, okay? Yeah. So they have to give the right answer. Um, so what they said was, when you're first starting a YouTube channel, you need to give data to the algorithm, right? Or to AI, uh -huh. so it knows what it's about. But, but it's not as significant as it once was, Correct, especially yeah. from once you build your authority around that topic. But when you have all those key, this is the thing that people don't think about and why the research is important. When you gather up all those tags and uh, phrases for the tags, you're starting to build up the verbiage you wanna use in your videos. Absolutely, yeah. You're starting to think about the images for your thumbnail. So you're, what you're doing is you're like feeding your brain all the things that this uh, vidIQ, go back to it real quick, this vidIQ keywords related uh, search tool is telling you is like these are all the things around this topic that people are interested in. That is so powerful um, to really consider because then you're really starting to build the vocabulary and the dialogue and speak not only to the person with that one specific title, but anybody around it. Because sometimes people are searching for things um, and it might be a completely different search and your title is what they needed, but you needed all those connectors, correct? Yeah. yeah. Uh, anything you want to add to that? Because that's a lot to unpack. I think it's a, a good way of um, your immersing yourself in the keyword is almost like through osmosis you get all of this um all of this context and then you're able to sell it through the thumbnail and we know youtube looks at thumbnails there's this cloud vision api tool which can actually uh, review a thumbnail and pick out the fonts and pick out the emotion in somebody's faces and we know that they go through every single frame of a video and again can pick out context oh, and they're picking up what you're saying in the video too that's absolutely a, yeah. like huge so again if you're saying it in the video because you research that in the keyword research tool on vidIQ it's helping you rank potentially it, then you're starting like fight for the inches going back to football one of my favorite speeches is we fight for those inches right yeah yeah every time you say that keyword or phrase you're fighting for those inches is to rank for that thing as long as you're obviously adding you can't just literally say the keywords and phrases you have to put it into some kind of context or body of work but literally these are the inches that you if you hear al pacino right now these are the inches that we're scraping for that's going to give you that slight edge and ultimately make your video better you've just given me an idea for a video actually mr beast uh, sometimes like reads a dictionary or say somebody's uh, name for a million times i'm wondering if i for 10 hours said all of the YouTube keywords for uh, growth, like how to get uh, more views, how to get more views 2019, how to get more views 2020. I'm wondering how that would, uh, YouTube would react to that. An interesting experiment maybe. Oh yeah, you, you guys totally <laughs> share that. That's one thing I love about VidIQ. You guys do do some fun things and some things are different. Again, I think that speaks to, um, you know, like what you guys know and your experience that you, you do 
do something a little bit different to stand out. Um, if you do and you get like millions of views, make sure you give me some credit, <laughs> <Absolutely. okay? laughs> I, will, I will mention video influencers at least 10,000 times in that live stream. I appreciate it. So, okay, cool. So anyways, we're going to dive into some more tools. Um, if you're watching this on the replay, just join the members area and we put up all the Q&A afterwards um, up on there. If you guys want to see more content um, from video influencers, go ahead and click or tap the screen right here. If you want to visit vidIQ's channel and subscribe for more content like this, as well as tutorials on using vidIQ, click or tap the screen right here. Make sure you download uh, the vidIQ tool for yourself. Go to vidIQ.com slash influence. I'm telling you, you will not regret getting this tool. So uh, we'll talk to you guys later.